There is a watercolor element that simply doesn't get the attention it deserves. And that, my friends, is watercolor vines. The kind of vines perfect for when you just don't know what to add to your painting next, or when your painting needs a bit of movement. Or honestly, I just adore painting random vines on scrap paper. It's my version of doodling. Let's jump in with some rough sketching, but stick around because we're gonna be painting soon enough. You need to consider three different details as you're sketching out your vines. Number one, the curve or the path of the vine. Basically, what direction is it heading in? Number two, the placement personality of your leaves on the vine. Are they ordered and symmetrical or are they quirky and random? And number three, the density of the leaves on your vine. Are they sparse or are they full? Now, obviously there is a lot of other elements you could consider, but these are three really good ways to start. Today, we're creating five different types of vines, so let's get to it. First, twirly vines. Think grape vines. Next, full leafy vines. Think sweet potato vines or a pothos plant. Next, the sparse leafy vines. I'm thinking kind of like young ivy. And then cascading vines like silver nickel or eucalyptus. Budding vines are last, like honeysuckle or even berry branches. But keep in mind, friends, I'm not going super realistic with any of these that I'm about to paint. They're all going to be transitional, and that means they could be turned into pretty much any type of vine for most type of paintings you might be working on. Today, I am using my Art for Joystick brush collection, so a variety of daggers, a liner brush, even the cat's tongue might make an appearance. And then I'm using the Arches cold press watercolor paper from the pad. And I always distinguish that it's from the pad because I really feel that the block watercolor paper just hits differently. First up, the twirly vines. Grab a green, any green with that quarter inch dagger or even a round brush is gonna work. And you're gonna start with a medium pressure and press. And as you press, you're gonna curve downward. These twirly vines are gonna be pretty straight overall. And I'm adding extra strokes as I work my way down. Some of them I'm dragging longer. Some of them I'm pressing harder. And some strokes start with a light pressure going to a medium or heavy pressure and then back to a light pressure to create that kind of thick and thin effect all in one stroke. Change your color up as you go. I added a little bit or a lot of pink on my brush, even a little too much, but I'm gonna go with it. And then continue back up the vine you already started with some thinner lines. And you want to kind of encircle the original lines you laid down with your brush with thinner lines that look like they're twirling around the original. Feel free to elongate the vine I just did there at the top with a really, really thin wispy moment from my brush to kind of elongate from where I started and just continue to build your vine. Think about how the tiny little tendrils would wrap around a branch. Where would the tendril be visible? Where would it disappear? And that's gonna help you understand where to make your marks. Grabbing my liner brush to get even finer moments, adding a few little swirls in there. Make sure you have enough water and pigment on your brush to get that nice smooth glide that you're looking for when you're creating really delicate lines like this. I do have a video all about the liner brush. I'm gonna link it below. Going in with that liner brush now and adding some contrast, just mixing up a darker green. Use the first green that you used initially and add a little brown, a little blue, a little purple to it, even a skosh of red, and you're gonna get a nice, rich, dark green to use as your contrast. Remember, these aren't realistic vines. This is Lucy Lucy watercolor today, friends. Using the tip of my dagger brush at just a slight angle, upstrokes and downstrokes to create little dab, little press and lift leaves here and there. Kind of thinking about like, little shoots. Maybe this is a grape vine that's really young and tender and it's got some shoots, some little things that are starting to uncurl and open up that look like they could be leaves. Maybe they're not, but you're just creating little dabs and dashes that give a suggestion of what's to come. Now let's take a look at how we could edit the same type of approach to make a completely different vine. 
Same idea, start with those downward strokes. Some are gonna be thicker and thinner, some strokes you're gonna drag longer. I'm starting with kind of a brownish, really darker olive green, and then I'm going into a more foresty, deeper emeraldy green. Don't you just love my super scientific description of color? And friends, if you're wondering why is that, like why don't I name the actual brands and the colors that I use? It's because I don't want you to get hung up there. I want you to just focus on what you have in front of you and be really proud to use the materials that you have at your disposal and not worry about matching up with mine. As you can see here with this edited version of the first vine, I'm definitely giving it more of an airy feel. So not as many strokes, not as many strokes that are indicating like a swirly twirly effect. I'm adding some longer and more obvious leaves as well with that press, drag and lift technique. And speaking of that technique, I'm going to definitely link a video below about it because so many of you have asked how I create my signature leaves, which I mean, let's face it, they're pretty simple, but man, once you understand how to do them reliably, it feels really good. And heading back in with that liner brush, adding some detail. Not as much contrast here between light and dark, but that's okay. This one honestly feels more like a grapevine wood because it's got more of those brown tones in it. So I'm happy. All right, friends, let me know, head to comments. Do you often use vines in your floral compositions? I want to know. And while you're at it, I'd love for you to give this video a boop. It really helps others find this channel. Thanks so much, YouTube. And I would love to make this community larger because y'all are amazing. And I love the fun that we have in comments and beyond. Moving on, here we go with our full leafy vines. I'm gonna bring in a brush I didn't originally mention earlier in the video. That's the three quarter inch flat wash brush. And wait until you see what this bad boy can do and how quickly. I'm gonna load her up with a decent, a, a pretty, more than decent, a good amount of paint and water and get it really juicy. And then at a slight angle, I'm gonna press and drag and I'm kind of creating these little strokey, dashy, and then blocky moments that are just starting to look like downward facing leaves that have three points. I am thinking very much of the sweet potato vine. I showed you a little bit of that earlier in the video and that's what I'm modeling this one after. Now I'm already thinking about the personality of these leaves. They're definitely fuller, so they're gonna be touching each other and there's not gonna be a lot of space in between. But I'm also thinking of the direction this vine in general is going to take. Bringing in my dagger brush early because I want to start to map out some of the actual stems and that's going to help me understand and better lock in all of the directional and personality elements that I just mentioned. Now you could certainly do that at the very beginning before you even touch a brush to paper with paint with a pencil. Going in with more of a traditional emerald green and adding some of those three point leaves with my brush. Notice the angle I'm holding the brush at. It's not a sharp angle. I'm not perpendicular to the page. I'm keeping in mind that as this cascades towards the bottom of the vine, I wanna make sure that the leaves get a little bit smaller and just a little bit more sparse. That's going to kind of replicate what I'm seeing when I do a Google search on the sweet potato vine. And I hope that that will give this a more realistic vibe. But again, I'm not after super realism. All right, let's do a version of the first vine and just edit the leaf shape, but not the concept. I'm going with more traditional kind of teardrop shaped leaves, same brush, and these are larger leaves and I'm just clustering them together so that there's not a lot of space again, just like our first one. And I'm definitely picking up different shades of green on my brush every time I need to reload. That's a little secret of mine and I don't always rinse in between, but it really keeps things interesting on the page. When you're using a flat wash brush, you're starting with the broad edge of the brush and pressing down to get that wide stroke, but then you can change the angle of your hand and release a bit of that pressure to finally use the thin edge of the brush to get a nice thin edge or end to your leaf. Finishing up with the dagger brush and a dark brown to suggest a little bit of a branch in between those leaves. Nice light touch and a few dashes and you're done. Now we've got the sparse leafy vine and for this one I'm going to map out with my brush the actual branches or vines or tendrils or whatever you want to call them with my liner brush. 
And again, I'm thinking through all of the elements, the direction. I'm thinking through the personality of the leaves I'll eventually add here and how wide I want the vine to be in total. All the things. I'm not stressing over it, but I'm definitely considering. Going ahead with my cat's tongue brush and dabbing in some small leaves. Dab and lift, dab and lift. Very little drag, just a little bit of a drag as I pick up my brush from the page. Drag dab and lift dab and lift change the angle of your brush sometimes the point will be facing back towards you sometimes the point can be facing opposite and you're going to get a totally different stroke depending and if you want to know more about this brush i do have a link below someone commented recently and said that when i mentioned the links below they felt like i was giving you homework which i can totally understand but you know you do you if you don't want to check the links below it's totally fine, but I'm happy to give homework. I mean, I do have a background in art education, so forgive me. I'm adding a few smaller leaves on these vines, just using the side of the brush. So instead of the broad side of the stroke, I'm using the smaller edge of the brush to create that tiny little line of a stroke. And then you can continue to map out additional vines and add more leaves. I use this particular approach so much in my floral compositions. Sometimes the vine isn't as long as this one. I shorten it up a bit or have less arms of the vine, but this particular approach with the sparse leaves is such a lovely compositional element when you need just a little bit of something that isn't too overwhelming. Now here's a fun alternative approach to the same type of vine. Start with the leaves first. Now with this one, you kind of have to know for sure your general direction of your leaves and the personality they're gonna take on. And is it sparse or is it full? I mean, obviously we're doing sparse here today, but you know what I mean. Just press drag and lift a few leaves, and then you can go in and connect them with the vines. I adore this. It kind of switches your brain and helps you think differently about adding details like this to a composition. It's also a great way when you're a little hesitant about adding a cluster of leaves somewhere. When you first add in the leaves and you feel like you wanna adjust something that you did with the leaves, you usually can adjust it by the angle of the vines you then add with your liner brush. You know, since we're using so many different greens today, friends, I would love to hear what brand and what particular pigment of green is your absolute favorite and why? I know this type of information is gonna be so helpful to the community. So head into comments and let's get that conversation started. Next up are cascading vines. I'm mixing up an ivory, a little bit of yellow, a little bit of a green that was left on my palette to get this creamy, kind of dingy greenish celery color that I'm actually digging. I love it. And I'm going to create little ovals. And the ovals aren't going to be all the same girth or length. They're going to definitely vary. And I'm thinking about the top of my cascade is going to be thicker and wider and more plump. And as it goes down, of course, it'll get thinner. And that doesn't necessarily always have to be the case. You can play around with having a vine that's heavier in the middle and thinner on both ends. So you do you, boo. I'm switching up my colors as I go, adding some purple to that original color, adding a little bit of peach to the original color, and then, of course, thinking about letting all of these ovals bump together so that they start to bleed into one another. And I felt like getting a little cray-cray, so I'm adding a more saturated blue in here, and I kind of like it. I am using my dagger brush for this. I'm holding the dagger brush pretty close to the bristles to get more control. And I'm also using mostly the tip of that dagger brush with a medium pressure. And just continue to work your way down and down, changing your colors if you feel like it. And you know what, friends? These could easily become grapes. And I love that. I love the idea that we can take one thing and make a few different marks and transition it into something totally different. Speaking of different, here's another way to kind of take the same approach and create a completely different cascading vine. Now, while I'm doing that, friends, I just wanna talk a little bit about how we use these vines. And I think it's so important because for those of us who are out here creating the loose watercolor florals that so much of my channel is about, sometimes it can be hard to figure out how to fill a particular spot. And so when you have the different types of vines in your watercolor creativity toolkit, you're never gonna wonder again. 
So for example, if you have a spot and it's right next to a big, bold, juicy, powerful focal point flower and you need something just a little bit of color and delicateness then you'll do a sparse vine and you'll feel confident about it or maybe you have a really soft colored focal point bloom that needs a little oomph to make it more focal maybe you'll do one of the more densely packed leafy vines to give it that extra something it needs to become more of a shining star in your composition and last but not least, we have the budding or blooming vines, and these can easily be transitioned into so many different types of blooms. Today, I'm inspired by honeysuckle. I have it growing in my backyard, and I adore it. It comes out super early in the season and makes me so happy. Honeysuckle looks like honeysuckle when you have a variety of leaves in terms of their size and their shape. So you've got some of these more rounded leaves, and then you're gonna have some leaves that are from the side or just starting to bloom, so they're curling open, and that's the key. The vine is very organic. There's not a lot of rhyme or reason to it. And so I'm roughing in a few different circle, lazy circle-like shaped leaves at different areas. And I'm keeping in mind that I want some to be bigger and smaller, but I also want some to be lighter and darker. And then with the tip of my brush and a little bit of more darkness on my brush, so a little brown mixed maybe with blue and a touch of green, I'm gonna go ahead in and add that main vine down the center and then connect all the other leaves that didn't get touched by that main vine brush stroke with a few strokes that indicate some thinner vines or branches, whatever you wanna call them on this one. And then we'll go ahead with a clean brush and add some of those honeysuckle petals. And they kind of like, are like a cup of little fingers or tendrils reaching up to the sky and the base of them all meet at the bottom at a soft point. And then a few pink strokes along the edge of that main vine to indicate some budding honeysuckle petals. And this might be my favorite one so far, and you know why? It combines almost all of the elements of the vines we've already painted so far. It's kind of the perfect quintessential blooming vine. Now we can easily transition this technique into a sweet pea. I'm using my half inch dagger and doing a press, curve, and lift three times over, meeting at the bottom center of each cluster. And I'm adding those kind of organically around the general area that I'm imagining my whole vine to take up. Some are definitely smaller and some might not have all three strokes. Feel free to change up the color on your brush or just dip the tip of your brush in a darker pink while the rest of your brush still has the creamy, softer pink on it. Start adding in some lazy round leaves and then connect them with a few stems. Once those stems are in, and yes, I did create those with my half inch dagger. I just used the very tip of it and very light pressure. Once those are in, add more leaves as you see fit. And if you wanna add some tendrils with a liner brush, you certainly could. I mean, what's a sweet pea without the tendrils? But apparently I decided this sweet pea has none. All right, all right, let me know who literally cannot wait to try their hand at this honeysuckle vine because yeah, she's a good one. Head into comments and give me a you bet. And while you're at it, I would love a like. That's a boop in Christy land on this video. Every boop you give really helps this channel and I am so grateful every day. Now you are ready to take some of what you've learned and apply it to a full composition with some focal point flowers. And this video is the perfect one to watch next. Now, until next time, I wish you so much happy painting, friends.